Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final seminar in our Politicians and Professionals series. Uh, and the David Hume Institute is again grateful for the support of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland, the Law Society in Scotland, and the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries in making this possible. Uh, in introducing the First Minister, I'm going to try not to make the mistake I made last week when I introduced Jim Murphy, because I meant to say that we were very grateful for him for accepting a uh, commitment made by his predecessor, but there had been a short interregnum when we didn't know who the Labour leader was, and I seemed to imply that anybody would do as long as they filled the slot. Um, I, did, I had the consolation of giving Jim uh, the entry to two of his best jokes of the evening, but I hope not to do that with the First Minister because uh, she accepted in her own name and we always knew it would be Nicola that was coming to speak. We're still grateful because, of course, when she did accept the invitation to speak, she was Deputy First Minister and I imagine on the day she became First Minister, any slots left in her diary mysteriously disappeared instantly. So we are grateful that she has made space in her busy schedule to come talk to us. Uh, our chair for the Q&A will be Professor Alexander of the Royal Society. But without further ado, I'll hand on to the First Minister. Thank you very much indeed, Ray, for that very warm introduction. And let me begin by assuring you that the day I became First Minister, the first thing I did was say to my staff, that appointment in my diary, accepted as Deputy First Minister to speak at the David Hume Institute, whatever else has to go from my diary, that has to stay. Such is the importance I attached to this event this evening. It is a real pleasure to be here this evening. I spoke, I think, at last year's series of lectures uh, and of course then it was in the run-up to the referendum campaign. I think it's fair to say a fair amount has changed in Scotland since then but uh, I think back to that occasion very fondly it was uh, I think a, I know a very good occasion and the audience that night was extremely engaged and asked some uh, very tough and uh, stretching questions so I've got no doubt the same will be true this evening as well. I think the last year in Scotland, certainly since I last stood at this podium and spoke uh, to an audience in this room, uh, the last year has demonstrated, I think very, very powerfully and very vividly indeed, that there's a, an enormous public appetite in Scotland to debate the big issues. And that means there is a real need, possibly a greater need than ever before, for forums in which people can debate these issues and engage with each other to test ideas and to challenge our established ways of thinking. And the David Hume Institute, of course, has been meeting that need for 30 years now. And today, in post-referendum Scotland, it does really seem to me that the work you do as an institute is more important and more relevant than ever before. So I'm genuinely delighted to have the opportunity to address you this evening. Of course, this uh, series of lectures is focused on the kind of country we want Scotland to be. And that was the big question that dominated last year's referendum wow. campaign. And it's a big question, I think, continues to dominate Scottish politics and indeed wider Scottish society. Uh, when we think back to the referendum last year, uh, when we were all deciding whether to vote yes or vote no, and I should say I decided quite some time ago. I, I wasn't one of these last minute swing voters. My mind had been made up for some time. But when people across the country in every single corner of this country were making that decision, do I vote yes or do I vote no? What we were all actually doing was engaging in one of the most passionate, wide ranging, and fundamental debates that any nation can have. We all had to ask ourselves what kind of country we wanted to live in. Uh, we thought about our concerns about the present and our hopes and our dreams about the future and came to a conclusion, 
each and every one of us about the best way to build the kind of country we wanted Scotland to be. And anybody who travelled the country, uh, as I did last year, would have heard time and time and time again. Uh, and I want to stress from people who were planning to vote no, as well as those who planned to vote yes, an overwhelming desire to be part of a process of building a better and a fairer country, as well as a wealthier and more economically successful country. Now, uh, the referendum, uh, as you probably noticed, didn't quite turn out the way that I had hoped it would. But nevertheless, notwithstanding that, I think that fundamental process of assessment and reassessment that the whole campaign came to represent has strengthened and energised our country. When I look back on that debate, with the small matter of the outcome, there's nothing about it that I regret. I think it was a thoroughly positive experience that energised and empowered and engaged people across this country in a way that perhaps uh, most of us have never been before. So the challenge we now have is to harness that energy and use it to build that better Scotland that most people who participated in the debate on both sides want to see. In, in other words, our challenge is to turn those aspirations for a better and a fairer society into reality. And when I became First Minister, which uh, is now almost 100 days ago, uh, it's amazing how quickly uh, time flies by, uh, but I set out a programme for government that was very designed to help achieve that. The programme for government I set out in the week after I became First Minister was based on the three priorities of prosperity, participation and fairness. We've got to build prosperity because a strong economy underpins the well-being of every single community in our country. We can't do any of the other things unless we have that strong economic underpinning, the vibrant economy and business base that generates the wealth that we need. And we want to encourage participation because we want to not suggest that government or the public sector have all the answers. We want to empower and enable people to improve their own lives and to help improve the lives of the communities that they live in. And we need to promote fairness because we all know that there are currently far too many barriers to opportunity that stand in the way of far too many people, whether that's as a result of background, income, geography, gender or disability. And we also know, and there's a wealth of evidence now to back this up, that inequality is bad not just for individuals and for our society, it's bad for our economy as well. The OECD estimates, and I find this quite a, a staggering uh, statistic actually, uh, the OECD uh, estimates that inequality reduced the UK's economic growth by 9% in the years between 1990 and 2010. So to put it quite bluntly, if we succeed in making Scotland more equal, we won't just raise the life chances of this and the next generation, uh, although we will, uh, we'll also enhance our economic prosperity. And that's why I believe so strongly that the objectives of a stronger economy and a fairer society should no longer be seen in the way that I think they have often been seen for far too long as competing objectives with a tension between them, but instead as mutually reinforcing. If we make our country more equal, we'll make it more economically prosperous. And if we make it more economically prosperous, if we do the right things, we can make it more equal as well. And as leader of the Scottish Government, I'm determined, absolutely determined, that we will use every power and every resource we have at our disposal now and in the future to progress these twin goals. That said, we can't ignore the wider context we're working in. And the hard fact of the matter is that the current UK government's spending cuts, largely endorsed by the main opposition party, make efforts to tackle inequality more difficult. The cuts we've seen so far over the past few years have had a disproportionate impact on women, on disabled people, and on families on already low incomes. And the UK party's plans for even more austerity in the coming parliament would hurt these groups in our society all over again and even more. 
So it seems to me that no politician can really be taken entirely seriously about wanting to tackle poverty and inequality unless they're also prepared to challenge the current Westminster model of austerity. It's also important to go back to an earlier point I made uh, to make that challenge because austerity, I think, in its current form has been bad not just for individuals but for the economy as a whole. You know, over the course of uh, this UK Parliament, which is just coming to an end, low growth is the major reason that the government has missed its deficit reduction targets by a total of £150 billion. Pounds. If you went the clock back to 2010, George Osborne said that by the year coming, he would have a £6 billion pounds surplus on his current spending. In reality, next year, what he's going to have, or whoever the Chancellor is, will have a £49 billion pounds deficit on current spending. So austerity, in my view, is not just uh, leading to a massive human cost, it's failing on its own terms. If it's all about cutting the deficit, it's not working in terms of doing that. And that's why the Scottish Government has set out an alternative approach, one based on limiting real-term spending growth to half a percent a year, not a king's ransom. But that policy of very modest spending increases instead of continued cuts would still see the debt and the deficit reduce as a proportion of our national income in every year from 2016-17, but it would also free up an additional £180 billion across the UK over the next Parliament, which we could use to invest in infrastructure and innovation, protect the public services we all depend on, and ease some of the pressure that is being felt by the most vulnerable in our society, the pressure that is widening the inequality gap at a time when all of our efforts should be on trying to narrow it. By offering an alternative to the austerity agenda, we can ensure that fiscal consolidation is consistent with a wider vision of society, a society which strives to become more equal as part of becoming more prosperous and more fiscally sustainable. And I think that is a better approach to simply ploughing ahead with more and more cuts that are piling on the human misery, as well as running counter to the efforts to reduce our national indebtedness. And the issue I want uh, to talk about, the key issue I want to talk about tonight, which is education, is a vital part, in fact, the vital part in achieving that vision of a fairer uh, and more equal Scotland. You know, in education underpins all of our efforts to create a fairer, a more productive and a more prosperous society. Uh, it is and it will continue to be a defining priority for the government that I lead. But it's also, and I won't be alone in this, in this room, it's also for me a personal passion. You know, the education that I was so lucky to get at Dreghorn Primary and Greenwood Academy in Ayrshire and then at Glasgow University is the major reason that I'm able to stand here today as the First Minister of Scotland. In fact, there was one teacher in my uh, secondary school that can probably, uh, unfortunately, uh, he's no longer with us, but if he was, he could probably claim more credit than most for me standing here as First Minister of Scotland. He was um, my English teacher and he was a Labour councillor. And when he realised I was interested in politics and current affairs, he, I grew up in a working class area in the west of Scotland. He just assumed I would join the Labour Party. So he brought in a Labour Party membership form one day, which stirred the rebel in me and made me join the SNP. So he probably could claim more credit than most. But to be serious, that education that I was lucky to get has been the defining uh, asset that has shaped my life thus far. So I do feel very passionately that every young girl, every young boy growing up today, regardless of their background, should get the same chances that I did when I was growing up. And tonight I want to talk about how uh, we as government will seek to achieve that, a focus in turn on the early years, on school education, uh, on uh, higher education and then on uh, wider opportunities for young adults. And in doing that, I will point to a number of areas, and I'll do so very frankly, where I think we need to do much better than we're doing right now. But my starting point is an optimistic one, because in many respects, this country is incredibly 
fortunate. A commitment to education is ingrained in Scotland's history. It's part of our DNA as a country. It's part of our very sense of who we are. Uh, we pioneered the idea of universal access to school education and sparked the enlightenment to the spirit of which still inspires the David Hume Institute today. Hume himself argued that the sweetest path of life leads through the avenues of science and learning. And we found out as a country relatively early on that education doesn't just sweeten life or bring enlightenment. Widening access to education also brings economic benefits. During the 18th and 19th centuries, because Scotland educated more people to a higher level than most other countries, we pioneered the Industrial Revolution and provided a disproportionate number of the world's great thinkers, scientists and inventors. Now, in many, many ways, our education system today still lives up to that wonderful reputation. In fact, in many ways, it's better than ever. More children are better educated today than at any previous time in our history. Higher exam passes are at record levels. Curriculum for Excellence is being successfully implemented. School leaver destinations are the best on record. Of the students who left school last year, 2014, more than nine out of 10 of them are in employment, training, or education. That's a great achievement. We've got more world-class universities per head of population than any other country in the world, with the exception of Switzerland. And I see the principal of one of them sitting here this evening. Uh, in fact, a survey last summer uh, from the Office of National Statistics showed that in terms of college and university qualifications, Scotland has the best educated workforce of any country anywhere in Europe. Now, if you just stop and think about it, even for a few seconds, that's not just a remarkable achievement, though it most certainly is a remarkable achievement. It's also a remarkable asset. It's an incredible advantage for Scottish businesses who are looking to recruit or for overseas companies looking to invest. And it provides us with such a strong and firm foundation for future economic growth. So that's a success story, and it's one we should be incredibly proud of. But we all know, I think, that although these achievements are hugely significant, they don't tell the whole story. And so tonight I want to highlight some of the areas where I think we can and must do better. And in particular, I want to focus on how inequality in attainment, starting in the very early years and persisting into adulthood, is weakening our society, it holds our economy back, and it constrains the life chances of too many of our fellow citizens. And the basic problem can be illustrated with just one statistic. In terms of qualifications, school leavers from the most deprived 20% of Scotland currently only do half as well as school leavers from the least deprived areas of Scotland. Now, I don't think any of us should accept a situation where so many people are unable to realise their full potential it's simply because of the accident of birth of where they happen to grow up. That lets too many people down. It's letting too many young people down right now. And I think it diminishes all of us. Now, these figures relate to school education. But we know that the challenges start long before children enter school. Uh, the Growing Up in Scotland study uh, published recently calculated the difference in vocabulary between children from low income and high income households. And what that study found was that by the time a child, children were five, that gap between the low income and the highest income children was already 13 months. So by the time children were five, the gap, the inequality gap was already that wide. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the first step towards tackling the attainment gap is not in school, it's to make sure that every child gets the best possible start in life. I'll talk about formal care and learning in a moment, but the issue is much, much broader than that. We've got to think about the well-being of babies and parents from pregnancy onwards. And that's one reason why our Early Years Collaborative is so important. Uh, since that was established in 2012, it's brought together health workers, carers, parenting organisations, and a whole range of others from every part of the country. 
And what it's doing is ensuring that the best evidence, the best research, the best practice is shared so that approaches which are working in one area can quickly be adopted elsewhere in Scotland. And the Collaborative has already identified several priorities and community planning partnerships across the country are working on these. So we're looking at better assistance for pregnant mothers, uh, encouraging better attachment between mothers and young children and helping parents to support learning. And all of that will have a big impact, not simply on attainment, important though that is, but it'll have a big impact on children's happiness and emotional well-being as well. And that collaborative is attracting international attention because it's helping to ensure that good practice becomes common practice, something that across a whole range of areas we've not always been as good as at in Scotland as we should be. Uh, so that is already helping us to create a better future for young children in Scotland. And of course, the establishment of the collaborative has accom been accompanied by a significant investment in early years uh, learning and care. Uh, this August, we will further extend funded childcare places to disadvantaged two-year-olds. We've already expanded the amount of care available to three and four-year-olds uh, from 412 hours a year to 600 hours now. And by the end of the next parliament, uh, if I'm in a position to influence this, as I hope I will be, uh, we would intend that that will go to more than uh, 1,100 hours a year, which will effectively mean that funded childcare matches primary school provision. Now, there are two things about planning an increase on that scale. The first is its economic impact. I was struck by something President Obama said in his State of the Union address last month, he argued that it's time we stop treating childcare as a side issue or as a woman's issue and treat it like the national economic priority that it is for all of us. Uh, and he was making uh, the fundamental point, and I couldn't agree more, that childcare is an economic necessity. Uh, I would describe it as essential economic infrastructure. It's as fundamental in its own way to enabling parents to work as the transport infrastructure that takes them to work every morning is. Better childcare empowers parents, especially mothers, to return to work, which is probably why last year the CBI cited more childcare as their number one priority in their plan for a better off Britain. But the second point is even more important. Childcare isn't just about enabling parents to return to work. It's fundamentally about providing the caring and the learning environment that every child needs in order for them to flourish. We already know that by age five, children attending learning and childcare settings that have high inspection ratings have got better vocabulary skills than their peers. And the really interesting thing is that that finding applies regardless of their family's income levels. So we know also that vocabulary skills are a key indicator of later attainment. So there's already evidence. If you do the right things and you get the right quality and standards, you can start to close that attainment gap and overcome the barrier of background and income. So by improving the quality of learning and care, uh, and we do that in a range of ways by supporting uh, workforce guidance and development, uh, we will improve attainment and reduce social inequalities. And that incidentally is why Curriculum for Excellence doesn't start in primary one, it starts at age three in our nurseries. And the key point, I think, is, is this one. Early learning and childcare promotes opportunity twice over. It enables parents to enter the workforce now and provide a better standard of living for their families. And it helps all children to make the most of their potential later in life. It is, and this is no exaggeration, in my view, it's one of the best investments any government can ever make. Uh, in my view, it's central, absolutely central, to any enlightened view of what modern Scotland should look like, and that is why it will be such a driving priority of my government. Uh, in fact, I uh, have confirmed today that spending on early learning and care, assuming we win the next election, uh, will double over the course of the next parliament. That's how important I believe it is. And of course, that's in addition to the extra capital spending we will need to provide to enable that. You know, it's often struck me that the great 
capital investment project of this parliament has been the Queensferry crossing, the new fourth bridge. Uh, and what I want is for the uh, great infrastructure project of the next parliament to be even more transformational. I want it to be the investment in care and learning facilities that we will need to ensure that our early years provision can match our primary school provision. Uh, and that will mean that we're providing uh, a different kind of bridge as our big infrastructure project, a bridge to a better future for children and for families across the country. So high quality learning and care in the early years will help to reduce the attainment gap in our schools if we do the right things. There is no <coughs> doubt about that. But we need to do more in our schools as well. Uh, I've seen in schools all over the country uh, just how much we owe to the passion, the commitment and the expertise of teachers who work in our schools. That's why uh, we're so determined to invest to maintain teacher numbers across the country. Teachers are the main reason for the significant successes that I've talked about already. The implementation of Curriculum for Excellence, the record exam results and the high number of school leavers in education, training and employment. But we need to do more to support <coughs> teachers and schools and we need to do more to support particularly schools with significant intakes from more deprived communities. In January, uh, we introduced free school meals for all uh, primary one to three school children. Uh, making nutritious, nutritious lunches available to everyone without the stigma that often attaches to means testing is an investment and the evidence backs this up that will benefit every child's health, education and well-being. Uh, and we're making a concerted effort to address inequalities in school attainment. Uh, two days ago I visited Bluegate Fields Junior School in Tower Hamlets in uh, London. That's a school that has participated in the London Challenge Attainment Initiative. 70% of the pupils who attend that school are eligible for free school meals. That's three times the average in England. But notwithstanding that, that school is in the top 20% of schools in England for reading, and it's in the top 40% for writing and for maths. Ofsted reported that it is an outstanding school in almost every respect. Again, evidence that if the right things are done, the right results can be achieved. Uh, some of the press coverage around my visit uh, to that school expressed some surprise that I was willing to learn from London. Um, but, you know, I've never pretended and never will pretend that Scotland's got a monopoly of wisdom in education or indeed in any other area. Uh, just as other countries study our curriculum for excellence or the early years collaborative, so we should be prepared to adopt good ideas from elsewhere. And we're not just looking to London. In Canada, for example, Ontario is another example of uh, somewhere that has achieved dramatic improvements in literacy and numeracy. Now, not all of the lessons of the London challenge or uh, lessons from elsewhere can or should be used in Scotland, but some of them are applicable, very applicable. It, one of the things that's very clear is that leadership is a huge factor in success. Uh, and we see great examples of leadership across Scotland and we're looking to build on that, which is why we announced earlier this week that the new qualification for head teachers, which will come on stream later this year, will become mandatory for all head teachers by 2018. And one lesson that London also clearly shows is that when efforts and resources are targeted, it is possible to achieve quite dramatic improvements. Uh, so we launched recently the £100 million Scottish Attainment Challenge. Uh, that fund will be focused initially on primary schools in the local authorities with the highest concentration of pupils living in deprived areas. And it's going to aim to improve literacy, numeracy, numeracy health and well-being because we know that if we can close the attainment gap when children are young, the benefits continue into secondary school and beyond. And what that will do is build on the other initiatives we're taking through our Read Right Count campaign and already funding attainment advisors in every local authority area. And what all of this does is bring a new impetus to closing the attainment gap, uh, making support available to all schools, but also putting additional assistance and resources where they're needed most, raising standards everywhere, but 
being determined to see the biggest improvements in the places with the greatest need. That, in my view, is a moral imperative because it's not acceptable that any child is held back because of the background or the circumstances of their birth. And it's all part of a wider ambition to ensure that everyone has a fair chance of skilled, fulfilling and productive employment. Your free higher education uh, tuition has become a touchstone of this government's commitment to equality of opportunity. And as somebody who benefited enormously from free higher education, uh, I make no apology for being determined to preserve that principle. Uh, the principle that access to university is based on your ability to learn, not on your ability to pay. I will uh, protect that principle for as long as I am in politics. But protecting the principle of free education, vital though it is, is not enough in itself. We've also got to remove the other barriers that prevent too many of the young people from our most deprived communities pursuing a university education. And we've got work to do here as well. Your children from the most deprived fifth of our communities make up only a seventh of university undergraduate intakes. So when I became First Minister, I set out an ambition that a child born today in one of our most deprived communities should, by the time they leave school, have the same chance of going to university as a child born in one of our wealthiest communities. And I want to stress that, the same chance, not just a better chance than they have today, but the same chance as anybody else. In other words, where you are born and brought up, your parents' circumstances should not and must not be the driver of how likely you are to go to university. And the work I've outlined in early years and in our schools will be fundamental to achieving that ambition. But we want to make sure we're doing everything we can. Uh, so we are in the process right now of establishing a commission on widening access. That commission will propose milestones, measure progress and identify how we can make improvements. And it will be central to ensuring that that ambition of equal access to university within a generation becomes a reality. And of course, it's part of a far broader approach to post-school learning, because ultimately the key test we need to apply is not whether learning takes place in a college, at work, or in university, <coughs> it's whether that learning is relevant, engaging, and it's widening people's opportunities. Uh, since 2007, sometimes controversially, uh, we focused colleges on promoting skills which help people to work and which support economic growth. And I see one of the principals of one of our major colleges here today as well. The number of students gaining recognised qualifications has increased by a third in the past five years. We retained educational maintenance allowances when they were being scrapped in England. We've invested in modern apprenticeships which are directly tied to job opportunities. And we've launched a national campaign to promote youth employment. And all of that has achieved results. We currently are outperforming the rest of the UK on all three youth employment indicators. We've got higher youth employment, lower unemployment and lower economic inactivity rates. But we know here as well we still need to do more. That's why Serene Wood's report last year into developing Scotland's young workforce is so important. And we're investing this year and next to make sure that we can implement the recommendations of that review. So whether it's supporting mothers in the early stages of pregnancy to helping people gain their first experience of work, the overriding message I want to leave you with tonight is that the government I am so privileged to lead is committed and will be committed to doing everything we can to promote opportunities and reduce inequalities. That said, it's not something that government or schools or colleges or universities can do on our own, uh, although our role is hugely important. It's got to be part of a national shared endeavour. I was in Glasgow earlier today announcing some investment for the Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations to continue to deliver its Community Jobs Scotland programme. Uh, that money will deliver at least 1,000 job training opportunities across the country, some of them, many of them, for vulnerable young people, care leavers, ex-offenders, for example, uh, for young disabled people as well. And that's a good example of how the third sector is working with us to help young people into work. Uh, businesses have also got a big part to play. 
Uh, businesses are already playing a big part. Uh, business won't always have a role in every part of education, but we must work with business on issues where there is an interest, whether that's in entrepreneurship in our schools or the delivery of modern apprenticeships. Uh, and the approach to education that I've uh, outlined tonight is part of a wider approach to sustainable economic growth. Again, bringing together that imperative to grow our economy with the equally important objective of giving everybody a fair chance in life. And that fundamentally is what it is all about. Everything I've talked about tonight is about achieving the basic ideal that I think of when I'm asked the question, what kind of country do I want Scotland to be? Uh, to put it very simply, I want Scotland to be a land of opportunity, but a land of equal opportunity, a country where every individual, regardless of background or race or gender, gets the chance to fulfil his or her potential. I think over uh, the last, I don't know, maybe a couple of decades, uh, there has entered into our public debates the idea that that is just an ideal. It's idealism and it can't be achieved. Well, I beg to differ. Firstly, I believe a bit of idealism in politics and government is a thoroughly good thing. It's what reminds you of what it's all about. But I also believe in a country, particularly a country the size of Scotland, if we have our wits about us, then we can achieve that ideal of giving everybody a fair chance in life. Uh, I quoted David Hume earlier, and he said uh, in the same passage that I quoted, that whoever can either remove any obstruction to education or open up any new prospect ought to be esteemed a benefactor mm -hmm. to mankind. And making education at every stage of life the foundation of that fairer society, uh, the importance of that I don't think can be overstated. The removal of obstructions to education, the opening up of new opportunities has been the focus of many of the things I've spoken about in my first 100 days as First Minister, but it's a subject that will continue to receive sustained attention for as long as I hold this office and for as long as my government holds office, because education is not just part of our sense of ourselves. It is most certainly that. But education is also the key to a better future for young people growing up in Scotland today and in generations to come. And it is at the heart of that fairer and more prosperous Scotland that all of us seek to build. Thank you very much indeed for listening. I look forward to you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got about 35 to 40 minutes for questions to the First Minister. A um, couple of things just before we start. Uh, people who are in the overflow room will have to come to the adjoining door and attract my attention if they want to um, ask a question. Um, could I um, use the same appeal as my predecessors in this place um, and ask for questions which are short and to the point and don't degenerate into many speeches. My predecessors haven't had success. I hope to have success. Uh, could you wait for the microphone? There are mics being uh, brought to both sides of the room. Uh, and I think, uh, First Minister, if you're happy to do it, we'll take two or three questions together and then, and then move on. We look to wind this up around 7.15, so in order to get as many uh, questions in as possible. Could you make your questions as short? Have I said that already? Uh, please do. Okay. okay, who's first? One there, one at the very back. I think it's Dr. Cohen by the looks of it, I think. And one there on that side. Is that this? just here? If you could see who you are, that would be very helpful. Chris Lewin. Um, I found your uh, speech very inspirational, but I'd like to ask you about a rather tricky and difficult subject, which is that some teachers are not of the quality that, are, that, that is needed. Uh, some are absolutely inspirational and brilliant, some are more sort of average, and a few are very poor indeed. Can I ask 
what you intend to do about this problem. Um, Bronwyn Curran, um, I'd like to say that I very much welcomed your comments on the significance of early years and the commitment that you've shown as a government to extending the hours. But you referred to extending early learning and childcare to match the hours of primary schools. And it perhaps won't surprise you to learn that some of us have been noting the attempts by some local authorities to reduce the hours of primary schools. So I'd like to ask you to comment on what the role of government should be in actually um, developing uh, hours for schooling, for primary school schooling, which meet the needs of parents <coughs> and society. And to consider how this relates as well to the fact that school age childcare has been diminishing rather than increasing and requires, I think, quite a lot of attention. And one over, on just there, thank you. Thomas Ward. Uh, First Minister, I was delighted that recently you visited a school in Tower Hamlets. Um, my question, though, is this. Um, the very sharp improvement in the standard of education in London schools that we see now is the result of changes introduced 15 to 20 years ago. And the obvious success of those changes was clear more than 10 years ago. Why has it taken the Scottish Government quite so long to notice what's been going on elsewhere? <coughs> Right, um, Chris, I think that you described it as a, a difficult and sensitive question. I think it's a, a central question. The quality of our education and the quality of our teaching workforce cannot be divorced. In my experience, the vast majority of teachers who work in our schools are of excellent quality and do a fantastic job. And uh, what I want us to be doing is supporting teachers to improve even further and to bring uh, all teachers up to the standards of the best. I spoke earlier on about the qualification for headship that is being introduced and will eventually become mandatory. At the same time, we announced some further investment into uh, master's training for classroom teachers to give teachers the ability to uh, further educate themselves, to train, to take advantage of best practice. So my, in any profession, in any walk of life, you will always have a small number of people who decide that they're not suited to that profession or, you know, the profession and them might mutually decide they're not suited to that profession. Um, but I would rather focus on us trying to lift the quality of all of our teachers to the best. And I think that's uh, what the, the policy interventions that I've been talking about in the last few weeks are, are designed to do. But we should never shy away from the, the issue that, that you raise because you know we, we're letting down young people if we don't you know tackle some of the tough issues in the, on this agenda as well as some of the easier <laughs> issues where there is uh, maximum consensus. Um, Bronwyn, um, there's a couple of aspects to your question that I want to quite briefly try to, to take on. Firstly, in terms of the specifics, uh, there are in at least a couple of local authority areas just now ongoing debates about the length of the school day and, and school week. <coughs> there are other local authority areas, unless I'm mistaken, this one where uh, some of those decisions were taken quite a significant time ago. Uh, so I don't want to get into the, the detail of particular local authority proposals. I'll make a general comment, though. I, I think what should come first is the needs of the young people in our schools, and I would have if I can uh, put it as, as mildly as this, I would have a, a, a degree, more than a degree of scepticism about uh, the compatibility <laughs> of an agenda about raising standards and attainment with an agenda of reducing the amount of time that children are spending in schools. Um, your other, I suppose your broader question is, the uh, phrase you used is, what is the role of, of government? And here we go into, I suppose, one of the uh, thorniest issues sometimes you, you encounter, not just when we're talking about childcare, but in any of the issues that take you into the relationship between central and local government. Uh, education right now is a, a statutory responsibility of local government. There uh, will be people in this room, no doubt, who think that maybe shouldn't be the case, but that is uh, the case, and you know that will, will continue to be the case. And inevitably, what you all often get is when people uh, don't like... Uh, the direction of travel of central government, they say these things should be decided by local government and central government shouldn't interfere. 
But when people don't like the direction of travel of local government, they want central government to interfere uh, very quickly. And we've got to get the balance right. But, you know, similar to my views on, uh, which have been uh, fairly well rehearsed over the last few weeks, my views on teacher numbers. Um, I don't think we can continue to have a situation where we say we're focusing on raising standards and closing the attainment gap at the same time as we're seeing teacher numbers reduce in our schools. And, you know, that's why we... Uh, got into a situation of saying very clearly to local authorities, we're going to invest in maintaining teacher numbers, but you're only going to get the investment if you actually agree to maintain teacher numbers. So there is very often a role for government as the funder uh, to be very firm in what we expect. Um, and I'm, you know, as I said earlier on, I would have a big question mark about the compatibility of some of what I've been talking about and reducing the hours that children spend in school. Um, Thomas... In terms of, I think, in, I'm going to come on to your question very directly, but I challenge perhaps slightly the premise of it in the sense that just because we've only started looking in detail at the London challenge doesn't mean we've not been doing many other things to improve the education that children get in our schools. And I, I ran through some of that. We've undertaken over the past number of years arguably the biggest reform that the school education system has seen in, in my memory, which is the introduction of curriculum for excellence. And I think that's been uh, a very good uh, reform which will reap benefits and pay dividends down the, the generations. Um, so there's a lot of work that's been go going on in our schools to raise standards. I think we've also seen some progress in terms of the, the inequality gap. But my judgment as a new First Minister is that we're not yet seeing the progress go as far or as fast as I would want it to do. And therefore, I'm being pretty frank that I want us to look at best practice elsewhere and see if we can use and draw on any of that best practice here. Often when you're a politician, I'm not moaning about this, it's just a fact of life. You're damned when you do and you're damned when you don't. So if you take a kind of open and honest approach to say, I want to look and see if there's more we can do by learning from elsewhere, People say, why did you not do that earlier? As opposed to say, well, you know, good that you're doing it now. But I'll continue to be as, uh, as open in that approach as possible. But I would, you know, totally challenge, and I think I did in the substance of much of what I said, the idea that, you know, we haven't done a lot of work to improve education because we have. I just think we need to accept and acknowledge where the remaining challenges are and be pretty determined and dogged in what we do to try to address the remaining challenges. I have two indications. Gentleman there, lady there, I'd like to take one more from this uh, group of questions. Anybody else? Gentleman right at the back. Gentleman here, lady there, gentleman right on the back on the right. Yep. Um, Andy Milne from, from Surf. Um, first of all, I just want to say I'm delighted to be living in a country in a world which is so full of inequality, where this is one of the top priorities of the government. i uh, delighted to be working in a, a society that's prepared to make that commitment. Two brief points, though. Um, you've talked about um, a foundation for education, Nicola, a kind of level playing field, if you like. You know, and I think some of my colleagues have made observations about the likelihood of a level playing field meeting the needs of Spartans against Barcelona. There are some others who, who start from a different position. And, <coughs> Education is one of those fields in which uh, middle classes in particular are particularly successful at accelerating away from a level playing field. So I'm just wondering if there are any moves the government might consider to uh, restrain that acceleration away while supporting others to ensure that they've got the fullest and equal opportunities. Second point would be, I thought your speech was very good in covering the full range of education in its formal sense within the educational system, but in a, in a society where opportunities for furtherance are lost at later stages in life and where people wish to retain playing a very progressive role in their neighbourhoods and communities with friends, perhaps not in a society that's going to be able to offer them conventional remunerated employment. I wonder if you could say something about the broader role of education in its broadest sense uh, later in life. Lady just here. Mairead Nikra, Harriet Watt University. Um, You've, in your talk, as in education systems generally, you have focused on achievements, degrees, skills, professions, work, etc., which is a primary reason of education today. But sometimes I wonder 
is education focusing now on doing rather than being? And is there any role within education systems now for thinking and for not achieving and for not being successful, but just simply being? Gentleman right at the back. Sorry. Uh, William Bredman. Uh, I'm, I'm asking, uh, can we afford the companies that don't pay tax? If we're constantly talking about... Uh, Sorry, I can't see you, could I? Right, top corner. All oh, right, yeah. sorry, yeah. Thank you. Glasses. I do need glasses, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that advice. Okay, <laughs> given. No, the idea is that if we're constantly needing more and more money right, to, sorry, uh, to do this for more and more education, more hours mm. for the primary schools, I think we need to get a grip of that situation. Absolutely. Okay, Andy, um, well, your first observation that inequality is now such a top driving priority, I'm totally in agreement with you. And I actually think it is one of the things that the referendum campaign helped to do. I cast my mind back to a couple of years ago at the start of that campaign, there was a real, uh, I, I encountered a real scepticism on the part of the media and you know, many others that we would ever get to the point where that became one of the defining issues, but it did become one of the defining issues. And I think what I said, we've got to try and harness that now into making sure it stays at the top of the agenda. And um, I'm certainly determined to do that. Your point about level playing field, we don't have a level playing field just now. That, that's why we do need targeted intervention to try to level the playing field so that people do get the same chances regardless of, of their background. But I'm not, if, if anybody gets, is, has got the impression from what I've said that I think we've got a level playing field, then I, I absolutely don't. It's a bit like the gender uh, balance uh, debate. You know, in, in order to get to the point where you've got a level playing field, you sometimes have to intervene to tilt the playing field. I tell the story occasionally. I'm digressing here, and I apologise for that. I will come back to the question. But when I appointed the Cabinet after becoming First Minister and appointed the 50-50 Gender Balance Cabinet, I got emails from people, uh, not all men, I have to say, a couple from women as well, uh, who asked me to uh, explain how, given I had a 50-50 Cabinet, how could I be sure that all the women in the Cabinet uh, were there on merit? Uh, I didn't get a single email asking me how I knew that all the men in the Cabinet were there on merit, which, you know, so, you know, why do I believe in... Uh, positive action to redress the gender imbalance because you know the natural uh, order of things is not doing that so you know that's why the attainment challenge is very focused on uh, targeting investment and resources and effort to lift uh, those who, who need that most to try and level the playing field a bit more for the future now I think your question was looking at it from the other end in terms of I, I may have picked you up wrong but private schools for example in the uh, perceived advantage that gives. And, uh, you know, we have a charities regulator that in recent years has been very focused on making sure that in return for the charitable exemption that uh, private schools get that they are contributing. And I think there's, it's really important that efforts like that continue as well so that we, and this will not happen overnight, nothing like it, so that we do and, and we can aspire to a day when uh, our education system is a leveller, not something that just cements the disadvantages and the inequalities that often children are born into. Um, and I think your question, second part of your question, probably was it Mary? Maraid. Maraid, sorry. Um, that Maraid asked, uh, because your question is about the non-formal wider, I, I'm an absolute passionate believer that education is not something that starts when you're five years old and go to school and stops when you leave school or leave university. Education is and should be lifelong. It should embrace formal education and informal education. And another strand of work that the Scottish Government's engaged in that might not immediately look to be related is the work we're doing around community empowerment and the legislation that you'll be familiar with that's going through Parliament, part of which is about building the capacity of community organisations and communities themselves to shape their own lives. And I I think there is a real link there between the lifelong desire and need for education and some of that community work so that it's not all about education in formal settings. And Mairead, I, I 
I'm somebody that believes in education for its own sake. And we live in a, a competitive world where, you know, whether we like it or not, we've got to equip young people for the workforce and enable them to uh, earn a living and make the most of themselves. But, you know, education is good for the sake of education. And uh, I would love uh, and do love the idea of, of just being rather than doing. I crave that state um, <laughs> most days of the week at some point. Um, but I, I would absolutely agree with you. You know, you cannot, you, you cannot put a value or a price on just the, the sheer, you know, beauty and worth of reading a book for the sake of reading a book or educating yourself for the sake of it. So, yes, education in, in our modern world has got a very practical uh, imperative behind it, but never, we should never lose sight of just the, the worth of it for its own sake. Um, and... William, um, my glasses are in my bag, so if, uh, if you ask another question, I'm maybe going to get them and put them on so I can see you properly. Um, tax avoidance uh, and tax evasion. You know, people try and draw a, kind of, some kind of distinction saying tax evasion is wrong and tax avoidance is somehow okay. Actually, it's not okay. You know, what, tax evasion is uh, breaking the letter of the law. Tax avoidance is breaking the spirit of the law. In my book, it's breaking the law either way. Um, people who don't pay the tax they are due. You know, we have debates and we'll continue to have debates about the appropriate levels of tax, whether that's income tax or corporate tax or whatever tax. But whatever level government set tax at, if you're obliged and, uh, and due to pay your tax, if you don't pay the tax you're uh, due to pay, then you're cheating everybody else in society of the services and the benefit that that tax pays for. Um, the UK has got one of the most complicated tax systems in, on the face of the planet. You know, tens, I think, 16,000 pages of tax regulations. You know, it's not surprising that people find loopholes to avoid paying tax. So do we have to crack down on it? Yes, we should crack down on it a lot harder. But we should start with a, a very simple statement that it is wrong, immoral, uh, and, you know, objectionable and downright wrong. Uh, when the HSBC thing uh, broke a couple of weeks ago, you know, there's all these people saying, how did that happen? How come the, the government and the regulator and the tax authorities weren't able to stop this happening? Well, the fundamental reason is that we've lived in a culture where nobody really thinks it's that wrong to do it. It's been accepted as what rich and wealthy people do. They pay experts to find ways of avoiding paying tax. Well, the starting point for getting to grips with it is saying that's not on and it's wrong and people who do it should be hauled to account and brought to book. Um, so I agree with the premise of your question 100%. I've got one indication from the back, one, another one on this side, and gentleman <coughs> right in the middle, about the third back row. Hi, um, question um, is regarding private schools, sorry, I'm Fiona Killen. Um, you, obviously in pursuing an agenda of greater fairness and equality, you, you touched on private schools. Are you comfortable with the idea of, of them actually retaining their charitable status at all and how can that be reconciled with a policy of promoting greater equality and fairness within Scotland? Gentlemen here. Uh, Kevin Lang from the Law Society of Scotland. First Minister, um, one, whilst we've been able to make um, some progress in the legal profession in terms of increasing diversity, particularly among solicitors, um, one area where we have found it difficult, and arguably we've gone backwards, has been about encouraging more from lower income groups to both study law and, and go on and enter the legal profession. It's one of the reasons why, I think as you know, we've, we've launched street law that we actually train up law students now to go into schools in the poorest areas to try and spark that enthusiasm about studying law and, and moving on to become a lawyer. Um, as important as it is to increase standards, it, can you perhaps say a little bit about how we can also increase aspiration uh, to try and encourage, particularly in those disadvantaged communities, to try and spark that enthusiasm about whether you become a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, or whatever, but it's not just about standards, but trying to spark that aspiration as well. And gentlemen in the middle of the third back row, I think. Hello, uh, David Peoples. Um, totally agree with everything you say uh, about making everything fair, but 
we're sitting and just a read through who's actually here tonight. Everybody's very professional. How how do you get the opinions of actual teachers who teach children in poorer areas, and how are they incorporated into your policies? Okay. Um, first question. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Fiona. Fiona uh, thanks. There is a debate, and there will continue to be a debate about uh, the charitable exemption that private schools get. The government's got no plans to change that um, at this time, um, but it has to be earned, and that's why what I said earlier on about the role of uh, the charities regulator and making sure that you know there is a, a quid pro quo for that exemption uh, is earned. So that's where the, the focus is at the moment. But I'm sure that will continue to be um, a, a healthy debate. I, you know, I've got uh, uh, one of the schools in, in my constituency is Hutchinson Grammar School, private school, which. You know, does very good work, I, I have to be honest, in terms of some of its inclusion policies. I'm sure it would be the first to admit that it could do more. Um, but I, you know, I'm, what I want to focus most of uh, my attention on is how we make sure in this country that we've got the best quality state schools that we can possibly have. Um, I want you know, to be in a position where no parent feels it has to send a child to private school because they are not confident in the quality of state education. So I'll spend uh, all my efforts in trying to make sure that we're improving as far as we can the state school uh, system that we've got. Um, Kevin, I mean, your question's one very close to my heart, obviously, because I'm one of these uh, kids from a working class uh, background that went to university to study law. Um, I, I should say, first of all, I think, while I think you're right, I think the legal profession has made progress and great strides forward. There's still a lot to be done. I mean, I, I was having this discussion with somebody earlier on today. When I went to university, um, which is, is not yesterday anymore, I started university, what, 25, more than that actually, uh, years ago. And even then, 25 years ago, my first year law class was more than 50% women. But if you look at the upper reaches of legal firms today, which is effectively my generation now at senior partner level, it will be nothing, nothing like that. So there's still, progress has been made, I don't deny that, but there's still such a, a lot of work to do, and that's only on the gender side of it. In terms of, I mean, your, your point about aspiration, I, I couldn't agree with more. One of the, when I was down in Tower Hamlets at the school the other day, one of the things they were talking about, which, you know, our schools will do, um, a lot of this as well, but every year they take uh, a class uh, to LSE, London School of Economics. You know, this is a school in one of the most deprived parts of, of London, but they you know, do things, and that's only one of the things, to make sure that these kids are seeing the opportunities out there, and, and that's part of what they do to try and instill uh, aspiration. There's no single answer to your question. It has to be tackled at all stages. Careers advice in school is is one um, aspect. It's probably not fair to use a, just one kind of anecdote from my own experience, but when I was at school and saw my careers advisor when I was, I, I can't remember, probably third year or second, third year at school, and I told the careers advisor that I wanted to be a lawyer, her answer to me was, okay, that's probably not for you. Um, you should be a teacher instead. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with being a teacher, but the fact is that careers advisor's answer to me as a working class kid wanting to be a lawyer was not that's great you know if you're good enough then you should aspire to do that it was well you know you should probably think about something that's more you know in keeping with somebody from your background so I would love to think that wouldn't happen today but you know getting the right advice getting the right experience and opportunities having good um, links between schools and universities and businesses having people coming into schools from all walks of life, just saying to young people, you know, the sky is the limit, the world is your oyster, there's lots of opportunities out there. So there's no single answer, but making sure that we instill that aspiration is, you know, one of the most important things we can do. There was a gentleman somewhere in here who was the fourth of three last time. Does he still want to ask the question? So I'm a, did I miss a question? Yeah. What, I think what, you probably did. Remind me what the question was. It. It was the young man in the middle about how do you get to... Oh, get sorry, to yes. I'd only I written think. down one word right. there in, in my handwriting. I couldn't quite read what it was, but it was uh, opinion. <laughs> yeah, opinion of teachers, it reminds me. Um, it's a good question. And, you know, first thing I would say is this, this is a wonderful occasion and, you know, the opportunity to speak to a, 
uh, professional audience like this is an important one, but you know, we need to make sure that our policies are informed by as wide a range of people as possible and by you know, the experts out there who deliver, have responsibility <laughs> for delivering these policies and know uh, whether they work or not. Uh, and in terms of the teaching profession, you know, we work in a whole range of different ways through the teaching unions, through uh, contact and discussion with individual teachers and individual schools to, to try to do that. Um, policy that is dreamt up in uh, offices in St Andrew's House uh, and not tested against uh, the real life experience of people who implement that policy will nine times out of ten not work. Um, so whether it's the teaching profession or any other uh, professional group, uh, that is hugely important. Hands up again, those that was about. <laughs> I've now got eight people. Um, <coughs> lady in the middle, gentleman over there, and Dr McCrone. Hello, Dr. Karen Lorimer. I'm a member of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Young Academy of Scotland. Hi. We are, we as in the Young Academy, are having a little bit of a Twitter uh, campaign under the hashtag aspirational advice. Apologies if you've already taken part, but can I challenge you in 140 characters to offer some aspirational advice to young Scots? And I will allow you to do it later if you want to on the way home. Thank you very much. I'm always up for a Twitter challenge. <laughs> what's, what's the... The hashtag, did you say? Hashtag aspirational advice. Right, well, I've got less than 140 characters because that hashtag takes up quite a few. <laughs> but I'll do my best. Uh, first Minister, Paul Little, City of Glasgow College. I know from real experience that you match your deeds with your words, and certainly the investment in Glasgow has really largely been down to yourself in your previous role. But given this clear aspiration for a fairer Scotland and a, a clear foundations in right across the education system, can we hope that you'll restore the parity of esteem between colleges and universities? And Gavin, please. Gavin McCrone. Fifteen years ago, I chaired a committee which recommended, amongst a whole lot of other things, the introduction of chartered status for teachers. And I'm rather dismayed to hear that this is now being wound up. The purpose of it was to enable really good teachers to advance their pay and their careers by moving beyond the main grade scale for teachers and rather than just having to go into administration. Too many of them thought that if the only way they could get higher pay was to become head teachers or assistant teachers or something of that kind, which they might not actually be particularly good at, but yet they could be very good teachers. Now the chartered status was supposed to be based on two things. It was supposed to be keeping up your knowledge. That might mean taking courses and things like that. But it was also meant to be based on an assessment of, that you were a really good teacher. Now, when it was introduced, that latter bit was dropped because teachers at the time were very reluctant to be assessed by anybody, <coughs> as far as I could make out. Now, the whole thing seems to be being dropped. That seems to me to be a great pity. Okay. Um, right, I think I dealt with the first question. I will um, take up that Twitter challenge when I, I leave here. Paul, I mean, I, you know, my, my view there should be parity of esteem between you know, all bits of the education system. I, I think I said in, in the speech, it's ultimately not where you learn that is most important, it's what you learn and how appropriate that is for what it is you want to do with your life. Um, not only do I think parity of esteem is important, I think <coughs> increasingly the alignment and the interaction between our university system and our college system to allow people who start at college to then move on to university to make sure we get that uh, working well is, is very important. So I'm, um, you know, I, I think on your side in terms of uh, the importance and the integral uh, relationship between colleges and universities there. Um, Professor McCrone, I, the chartered teacher uh, scheme, I, I suspect the issue, and you may have alluded to this, is uh, when the scheme was introduced, we didn't follow your recommendation entirely because the, the chartered teacher scheme has been discontinued because the evidence and the opinion of uh, those in education was that it wasn't working the way it had been <coughs> intended to and it wasn't having uh, the effects uh, that, you know, the, that, that had been intended. And perhaps, I'm, I'll, I'll go back and look at this in more detail, perhaps the mistake was that your specific recommendation wasn't implemented in exactly the way you had intended. What I, I'm very keen that we do, though, is, is, is in discontinuing that scheme, we don't lose some of the key aspects of it. I referred to our investment in master's education for teachers, and that's 
what the advice the government took was the key part that we should continue to invest in is making sure teachers can remain in the classroom but have the ability to keep their learning up to uh, scratch and advance their learning. Um, other elements of it, I, I will happily go and cast a fresh eye over your original recommendations to see if there are other parts of that that perhaps didn't get taken forward as that <coughs> policy was implemented that we could in another form uh, look to progress. And I'll let you know what the outcome of my uh, consideration is. I can take another three. Is that Susan there? Susan, please. Gentleman in front. And is there any part of the room that I haven't come to? I like to be fair wherever <coughs> possible. Um, gentleman here, because I've been, I've, I've done an awful lot around that corner. <laughs> Unfair to those that I didn't choose, but there you go. Susan. Hi. Uh, Susan Deacon, um, many of the changes and aspirations that you've outlined tonight require creativity and innovation and leadership at a local as well as a national level, whether that be in communities or at school level in a college or a university. Many people have a concern that throughout 16 years of devolution, successive parliaments and governments in different parties have been too quick perhaps to prescribe how change should be driven rather than just set the standards. Um, could you comment on that and, and suggest how you think that local creativity and innovation can be best supported and encouraged? And specifically in relation to communities, which is so important for families and young children, how do we ensure in going forward that initiatives that develop organically at a local level that can be so important are supported and encouraged to flourish and that change isn't just driven by professionals in the state. Anton Galella, ICAS. First Minister, thank you very much indeed. Uh, there's a compelling vision there about the nature of Scottish society, something different. And I know over the last year, you have articulated this in different ways. It was articulated through the referendum process. But you're, you're in a gathering of professionals today. Is there time, is the time now, First Minister, to articulate a new narrative of the nature of society in an audience of professionals? Today, we're looking at the mandate to teachers to create the next generation. But in ICAS, we've been looking at not only delivering quality services to clients, but civic good, public good, a role in society. And is it now the case that it's not just the burden and responsibility of teachers to bring the next generation, but the professional, the professionals in Scottish society to play a bigger role in education and a bigger role in creating this next generation and assist their aspirations? And the last question. Thanks, Rob Utram. Uh, in a few years' time, the Scottish Parliament is going to have extensive new tax-raising powers. Would you consider using any of these to increase the resources available for education, or indeed other uh, initiatives aimed at reducing inequality? Okay. Uh, Susan, I, I don't think, um, and I, I don't argue with your uh, observation that there is a perception, and at times it's been a reality, that that's how the Scottish governments of uh, all colours and the Scottish Parliament uh, in general has been seen to, to behave. But I don't believe it's for the role of national politicians or governments in all senses to prescribe how change is delivered. I think it is our job to uh, set the outcomes we want to see delivered. And, and the Scottish Government under my party in setting the national performance framework has tried very much to shift that thinking we won't always have lived up to that shift in thinking in our practical application because you know we're we're imperfect, um, but we need to uh, seek to do that. But we we shouldn't be we should be uh, setting the goals, setting the outcomes, setting the objectives, uh, but trying to harness whether it's local leaders or leaders in professions or the leaders where they happen to be most effective to drive that change themselves. Uh, so you know that's why in the school context I've put. I've, a lot of focus on the role of the head teacher because a head teacher in a local school will know far better than I ever will what's going to work in that school to, to deliver change. So I, I think that's really important. There is always a challenge 
on the part of national politicians, perhaps particularly in a relatively small country, always to be seen to be stepping in. You and I share a background as health uh, minister. We both know, uh, you know, the expectation in Scotland, perhaps more than in a bigger country, for the health minister to be at the hospital bedside whenever anything <laughs> is going wrong to, to sort it out. So, you know, there's some of that which is just inevitable um, in terms of the expectations people have. But the best change will come when it's driven by people on the front line, at the grassroots level, whatever you want to describe it, who know what uh, is best done. And that's true of the kind of organic community change that you talk about. I, I mentioned the community empowerment legislation earlier on, and that's not the be all and end all, but at the heart of that is the belief that the change that will make the biggest difference in communities will come from communities themselves. I mean, I see examples of that every single day in my own constituency. The change that is driven from the top down will inevitably, not always, but more often than not, will fail or it will be short-lived. The change that actually genuinely comes from the, the grassroots, from the community, is the change that will make the biggest <laughs> difference. Uh, but often it's the top-down change that gets the biggest investment and resource and the community change that struggles, and that's the balance that we've got to shift. Is any of this easy? No, but you know we've got to, to do it. And national politics, and again, we both know this probably better than anybody in the room, national <laughs> politics, and party politics rather, gets in the way of that because when you're in opposition, you'll use any stick, as you know, to beat your uh, opponent over the head. And when you're in government, you'll say, well, no, come on, we've got to allow, so we've all got an obligation to allow the space for that to happen and we're not always as good at it as, as we should be. Which takes me, I think, quite neatly to your question, Anton. Um, the narrative I am trying to develop is, is one of a kind of shared endeavor. You know, I said earlier on, and throughout my whole time in politics, there's been this sense, not just in Scotland, but I'll, I'll talk in the Scottish context, that you're either, as a politician, you're either on the side of business growth or you're on the side of tackling inequality and promoting fairness. And it's always been seen, so politicians are seen as left, right, in terms of which side they're seen to, to fall on. So I talk a lot about tackling inequality, which in the words of the media or critics will be lurching to the left. I want to challenge all of that. We can't do one without the other. They're two sides of the same coin. And it's about all of us trying to do that together. It's about businesses and professionals understanding that if we have a better, fairer society, their businesses and professions will prosper better as well. Um, so that's the kind of approach that I want to try and, and see us develop more strongly. Uh, and I do think, just as I think there's a role for business and education, uh, I think there's a role for the professions and for professionals. <coughs> the aspiration point that was made earlier on, you know, having role models for young people, particularly young people who grow up in from backgrounds where they might not come into contact with uh, those kind of role models uh, very often, having the right role models to tell young people that there are, you know, many different things they can achieve is, is vitally important. I think business and the professions have got a big part to play in that. Um, and uh, so was it Rob? Rob. Um, I, as we get new tax uh, varying powers, and uh, unfortunately it's probably still a few years away until the, the new powers, well, we, we will get some limited new powers uh, from April next year in terms of income tax, and then hopefully in the not too distant future we'll get more extensive powers over income tax. And we, we have to look at uh, using uh, those powers depending on the circumstances at the time, the prevailing economic circumstances and the social and economic objectives that, that we set. Um, there's no point in having uh, tax varying powers if you don't consider using them, but no responsible government should, you know, two, three, four or five years in advance tell anybody how they would exercise powers over income tax. You have to make those judgments at the time in the context of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, my worry about uh, the tax powers we have at the moment, the ones we'll get next year, and even in terms of the Smith Commission, the ones that we will get over the, the more medium term, is that they're still very constrained. And you know, any government needs to have the ability to pull different levers, to have a basket of taxes, to have a, a very diverse <coughs> revenue base. Uh, even with the Smith Commission proposals, 70% of all tax powers will still rest 
at Westminster, that balance, I, I'm, I believe in independence, obviously I think that balance is wrong, but from a, an economic management fiscal responsibility point of view, I would argue that that balance remains uh, way out of kilter. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before I call on um, uh, Ray Perman to conclude proceedings, can I just thank you for all your questions, most of which met my exacting standards of brevity. Unlike the answers. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Ray. Thank you very much indeed. Can I, on your behalf, thank the First Minister for a uh, very thoughtful speech and one which touched on themes which are of uh, great interest and concern to the David Hume Institute Education. We have a, a study uh, jointly with the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which we'll be publishing before the summer, and Inequality. We published groundbreaking work on inequality in Scotland by Professor David Bell in October, and we're following it up with fresh work this year on the policy implications, how we can tackle uh, inequality. So those were themes which are of terrific interest to us. Um, uh, this concludes the Politicians and Professionals series, but do look on our website for the spring series, which starts on uh, March the 10th. You might be interested if you have a spare evening. <laughs> Nicola, we have Paul Johnson of the Institute of Fiscal Studies on the outlook for the public finances after the general election. And then at the end of the month, Tricia Marwick on the need to strengthen the Scottish Parliament uh, in order that it can properly scrutinise the uh, doings of government. Um, I'm always doing that. <laughs> uh, in, in April, um, on a slightly lighter note, Lord Sutherland on greed from uh, David Hume to Gordon Gecko. I think David Hume and Gordon Gecko had slightly different views about greed, but it should be a good evening. Anyway, can I just again thank the First Minister and invite you to continue the conversation in the foyer over a drink. Thank you very much.